My name is Linnea, and I am dying. I can say this with assurance because I have a terminal illness for which there is currently no cure. I can say this calmly because I have been dying for a very long time. Dying, not a done deal, but rather a process, something we all must do. Like most people, I assumed death was a problem to be dealt with later. This illusion was shattered at the age of 45 when I learned that I had lung cancer. A never smoker, I was stunned. Wife, mother to three, the youngest of whom had not yet turned eight. Two weeks after my diagnosis, the lower lobe of my left lung was removed, quickly followed by four rounds of adjuvant chemo. The hope was that I should be cured. My first scan post-chemo revealed a new nodule in what remained of my left lung. One became three, three became 30, spreading through my lungs like some malignant lace. Three years after diagnosis, a biopsy confirmed metastatic spread. When I asked if it was time to get my affairs in order, the answer was yes, three to five months in which to do so. Two weeks later, our beautiful daughter was married. In the photos from that day, I am smiling, but inside, my heart was breaking. Life would go on, but it would go on without me. Our youngest son was now 11. He could not even say the word cancer out loud. We arranged for him to see a grief counselor, and I signed up for therapy as well. Two months passed, and I had another scan. I thought it would be my last. But at the appointment, my oncologist had some news. My recent biopsy had been submitted for genetic testing and had come back positive for a newly identified driver in lung cancer, an ALK mutation. By chance, a clinical trial for an experimental therapeutic that targeted this mutation had recently opened at the same hospital where I received my care. One other person had already enrolled. Early indications were that the therapy had been working. However, this individual had quickly died, in part because of side effects from the trial drug. We were talking about a first-in-human trial. I understood that if I said no, I would certainly die, and soon. If I said yes, well, perhaps I could extend my life by several months, but I worried that I might also hasten my demise. I had never been risk-averse, but I was averse to dying. I agreed to enroll. On October 1 of 2008, I became the fourth person in the world with non-small cell lung cancer to take an ALK inhibitor. Within days, my cough began to subside. Seven weeks later, we reviewed my scans. This is flipping amazing, said my oncologist. <laughs> and it was. My cancer had seemingly melted away. I burst into tears, tears of joy. My oncologist cautioned that this did not represent a cure. It was only a matter of time before my cancer would become resistant to inhibition. And when it did, there was no next therapy. I didn't care. This was almost like being born again, a nightmare turned fairy tale. That spring, my story was featured on the NBC World News. I started a blog and leapt into advocacy. 
One year later, the predicted progression began. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I eked out two more years until the next ALK inhibitor came to trial. This was followed by a return to chemotherapy and then my third phase one clinical trial. It has now been almost 15 years since my diagnosis with lung cancer. <laughs> 15 remarkable years. In three days, I shall turn 60. My oldest child is 35. My youngest is in his fourth year at MIT. Knowing my children as adults has been an extraordinary experience, one I did not believe I would have. My continuing survival seems like a miracle, but I know better. Much blood, sweat, tears, and money have gone into keeping me alive. Clinical trials are not for the faint of heart. They are time consuming, consuming in general. I max out my deductible in January every single year. Many are under the impression that clinical trials are free, but in truth, insurance is billed for almost everything other than the experimental therapeutic. That means the patient is responsible for co-pays and other expenses, transportation, parking, lodging, meals, those come out of pocket, our pockets. Procedure rich, trials involve a greater time commitment, and they are often rapaciously hungry when it comes to data collection, blood, tissue, scanning schedules. My particular cancer is confined to my lungs and yet, because it was mandated by one-size-fits-all protocols, I have had, in addition to more than 100 spiral CAT scans of my chest, 60 abdominal CT scans, and 42 brain MRIs. Not only an excessive amount of radiation, each of those non-clinically indicated scans was billed to my insurance and I paid the co-pays. Several years ago, I asked the sponsor of my most recent trial to amend the scanning schedule to standard of care every three months rather than every six weeks for all participants who had been enrolled for one year or longer. When there was no response to my request, I took the bold step of becoming non-compliant refusing to get any more abdominal CT scans as well as injected contrast with my brain MRIs out of concern per gadolinium retention. Gadolinium is a heavy metal used in contrast to enhance imaging. Despite my noncompliance, a year later, my brain MRI was positive for gadolinium, also known as a brain stain. It is a finding with poorly understood consequences, but having heavy metal in my cerebellum cannot be a good thing. My personal experience has transformed me from advocate to activist. Medical research is my lifeline, and I am both a huge fan and major proponent. However, I think it is important to always keep a balanced perspective. As an activist, I now advise both pharmaceutical and biotech companies on ways in which trials can be made more patient-centric or user-friendly. You can't just build it, I tell them. You have to build it better. The terminology of trials is problematic. Participants are referred to as volunteers. Healthy volunteers are compensated for participation in trials because, frankly, they wouldn't volunteer otherwise. But those of us who are desperately ill 
emphasis on desperate? Well, we pay to participate. And calling us a volunteer? Clinical trial participation is not some extreme form of community service. None of us has chosen this circumstance. It chose us. There is an argument that compensating vulnerable populations for clinical trial participation constitutes inducement. Both language and concept are, once again, patronizing and exploitive. I am induced only by my imminent demise, and compensation would serve simply to reduce my burden. Recognize that words like compliant and non-compliant have no place in a healthy partnership. Participants in clinical trials are in a co-dependent relationship with investigators and sponsors where the power is not evenly distributed. Because of this uneven dynamic, I took a huge risk when I became non-compliant as I could have been booted from the trial. Fortunately, I was not, and better yet, Almost two years ago, the sponsor changed the scanning schedule for all participants to the one I had requested. We all understand that medical research cannot be advanced without clinical trials. Participants in first in human trials perform a necessary service to society. However, there remain many barriers to participation, from lack of access to precluding conditions. These need to be addressed if we wish to increase enrollment. My extended survival would never have been possible without medical research. I was in the right place at the right time with the right oncologists. I am exceedingly grateful for my good fortune. I am also weary. After all these years of fighting, I have come to a place where there are once again no good options. Soon, I shall return to chemotherapy as I continue to hold out hope. I remain ready to do whatever it takes to survive. However, I harbor no illusions. It is a harsh reality that the primary incentive and justification for developing novel therapeutics is financial. A terminal illness that is chronic is inherently problematic. A lack of therapeutic options represents a hard stop. It is a hell of a note to understand that one's ability to survive in seemingly insurmountable circumstances is not sustainable, and not for lack of trying or stamina, but rather because you now represent such a small percentage of an already limited population that any more output on your behalf is a diminishing return. Should clinical trials be regarded as social contracts, the investment in outliers such as myself might be something I could continue to count on. As it is, all plans I make for the future, my future, are contingent. In the meantime, there is nothing to do but to go on living and loving, writing, advocacy, activism, online dating, the vintage clothing business that I have resurrected with two partners, cheekily called the House of Redemption, a new art studio in an old mill in Lawrence I move in next week, time spent with one of the millions of my dear friends, time spent with my children, I am not afraid to die, but I will always 
choose life. May there actually be a choice. Thank you.